Okay, so the next macromolecule was lipids. Lipids are mainly going to build that plasma membrane, and we also can use them as fuel. This is your basic structure of a lipid, and it's right here for the most part. The biggest thing between lipids and proteins is that these fatty acid chains are as simple as it gets. Like there's no little single units. The single unit in this case is the full chain, and you hook three of them up all together, and that's how you get the fatty acid. This is just a chemical called glycerol that you're going to hook those onto. You don't necessarily need to know anything about it, just that it combines to have three chains of fatty acids. So you can kind of visualize that here. The biggest thing with fatty acids is that water does not interact with these. Remember that water has the, uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen area. And so remember that water is essentially, here, I'm just going to do, yeah, those two. Water will interact with itself because it has that negative charge and then that positive charge is on those hydrogens out here. So other water molecules are going to start interacting with those charges and make them kind of interact with themselves before they would ever interact with something that's not charged. That's the thing with these carbon chains is that they basically hate water because none of these bonds are polar or charged or anything. There's no plus or minuses that anyone wants to interact with. So you don't necessarily need to know this, but you can use this if I ask you a question for differentiating factors. Remember how we have a peptide bond for proteins, we have a glycosidic bond for carbs, you have an ester linkage for these fatty acid tails to the glycerol backbone over here. And again, this bond can happen just with that OH group. And we remember that the OH groups are kind of the biggest thing or the biggest indicator that a bond can happen. So remember that these are hydrophobic and that water would rather interact with itself than interact with a chain of carbons that has no charge. It's probably the best way to remember. So we saw unsaturated and saturated fatty acids. When you have that double bond, so it's unsaturated, you have this kink in the structure that's going to make those membranes more fluid because you are going to have little like kinks in the structure that are going to make things kind of be able to spread out a little better, if that makes sense. And that's going to allow more fluidity and for that plasma membrane to be a little more welcoming to changes. Trans and cis fats, you don't necessarily need to know. It's just a good story to know about. And it kind of shows how each of these bonds can still have a lot of power um, determining what can be digested or used, even though it seems like a very simple chemical, um, chemical change. But something like this is a good intro for what you'll see in orgo or physical chemistry sometimes. So the main component of lipids is to form this bio, that plasma membrane bilayer. So we can see that down here, remember? There are three different ways to visualize this. You can look at the pure chemistry over here. Here's a phospholipid head. And what that is is that you have this massive phosphate group that can bind to all kinds of stuff. It has these these positive and these negative charges sticking out. So it's very hydrophilic because remember, positive and negative charges love getting bound to water. So this area loves H2O, this whole, yeah. This whole area loves interacting with H2O. This is just a straight up carbon chain. It has no reason to like H2O. It's very nonpolar, it's very hydrophobic. And this is the arrangement that those fatty acid tails can eventually come in. So if I ask you for the structure of something, you would say, okay, here's the hydrophilic phosphate head. Here are the fatty acid chain tails. They are hydrophobic. And this is great because this forms this whole hydrophobic border. And what we remember we saw later in when we're doing the plasma membrane is that that serves as a great border that the cell can decide who and what is invited in and who's not. So alongside saturated fatty, unsaturated fatty acids making the membrane more fluid, cholesterol does the same thing. It just basically inserts itself in the membrane. That means that there's more fluidity right here because of that little space. That's it.
You don't need to know any differences between HDL and LDL. It's just good to address those two. Um, but anything that we're talking about in this class is just this HDL, which is just what's basically fitting in there. This is just a good example of how to make a little fatty acid Trojan horse, basically. And you have all kinds of stuff in here that you can deliver to cells. So, and what we should cover here, too, is that these protein, these chains, they can be used for energy. They're just not as effective at, at being used for quick, immediate energy, and they have to get incorporated a little later, but they're great for storing energy. As we saw, they take up a lot less room than glycogen does to store the same amount. So, very important structurally, um, a little less important energetically than carbs. So, we're now on to proteins. Right here, this sequence, we will cover it in detail later, but knowing this sequence is very, very important. DNA stores this information, RNA takes it out to become a protein, but once it becomes a protein through translation, that's really, really when things happen. Here's all these examples of what proteins can do. They are essentially, they are genes that are actually working. They're the things that are doing all the work. All these, all these little cartoons that we always see, enzymes, all that stuff, those are proteins. That's what I can stress to you. Another big differentiating factor is right here, is that if our bodies can help it, we only rely on proteins for energy at the last possible minute, and that's it. They are much more better used to make genes basically come alive as proteins, as these long chains. Because remember, all this info is stored in here in these DNA nucleotides. It gets transcribed into this copy, this single strand of our mRNA, and this copy gets taken by the ribosomes, which remember are those two big chunks of proteins. It's fed through, and it's going to translate every three little nucleotides into a protein and you're forming amino acid monomers into a polypeptide. You don't need to know each of the names of these, anything like that. I just want you to know that some are nonpolar. They don't have any charge, or they don't have any charge that's going to do anything. So the little shaded areas are what we're talking about. These, see how this structure up here is never really going to change? That's just your basic amino acid. What these changes are are called R groups the letter R, they are each specific. So most of these you can see, they don't have any charge. They're not gonna interact with water. These are polar ones. They have some charge. They have little bits of charge, plus and minus. Over here you just have your straight up, this is just a straight up negative charge. These have straight up positive charges. These also really enjoy interacting with water. Again, we saw that each amino acid, so one, two, oh, and then three over here. Each of these is going to incorporate it in single units together through peptide bonds till you have a chain that forms. This is just good info to know. Um, you can use this if you want another differentiating factor is that some proteins we have to eat. We can't produce them on our own. So as far as protein structures go, this is the beginning. This is just primary. All it is is that it's just the linear sequence of each little amino acid and how it goes. So here's a little primary. It's just one by one by one. Sometimes the way that the primaries go can form a helix, and that's what you see here. So these are like little structures that we can observe in proteins depending on the order of these primaries they'll actually end up forming things like this helix. What you should know about tertiary is that tertiary is essentially, this is just the entire protein visualized all at once. That's it. That's what tertiary is. It's the full protein chain, and you're looking at the whole thing. See right here is a secondary form is a helix, but it's just one part of the full thing. Quaternary is when proteins come together and form one large unit. So you can see right here that four different proteins come together to form hemoglobin. So we talked about what I want you to know with the side chains is that some of them are polar, 
those R groups, those special, those things that make the special, the amino acids special. Some are nonpolar. The ones that are nonpolar are hydrophobic. They are going to hide in the core of the protein. They are never going to interact with water because remember, all out here is water, everything. Now, hydrogen bonds that we've seen form with water, those are going to form really well with those polar side chains. All those polar side chains are on the outside interacting with that water. That's how water comes into play and is very, very important because all this life that's happening is always going to be in this aqueous environment. So when the proteins are designed, they have to have enough, pro or enough amino acids that can interact with water for them to go out into the world and start doing things. Okay, the idea of micronutrients is good. So you not only actually eat DNA from you know whatever you're eating, just little nucleotides can come in. You also get ions, so we get sodium, for example, we get potassium, and we saw that we use ions for our cells to like pass back and forth and create charge, things like that. You can, you, vitamins are a good micronutrient example. So for example, this hooks into this enzyme. So B9 hooks into an, an enzyme and activates it essentially. So vitamins need that. Sometimes minerals themselves are incorporated into our specific physiology, like bones, for example. I don't know what that is. So we're not consuming these for energy directly. They're made, they're either incorporating into specific structures in our body, or they're going to activate specific things. And here what we saw is that you can be deficient in micronutrients sometimes, or you can have too many. And each of these is pretty familiar to us as something we've seen in our diet and like kind of seen how like kind of it's it's necessary in a really small amount. But we don't burn iron for energy, and iron doesn't form structures in our cells, for example. The same thing is true for sodium. So as far as what to study, you know, you don't need to know any this whole table or anything. You know, I don't want you to have to, like, memorize stuff like this. I just want you to have the idea of what a micronutrient is versus, like, a carb or a lipid. If you can give me differences between those things, that's what I'm going to ask you, basically. So we talked about how malnutrition is basically... This is when your cells break down because they don't have enough of those micronutrients or macronutrients. Energy, so when you actually are starving, that's when you literally just don't have any energy. Okay. So we're on nucleic acids. The main thing that I want in this section is just I want a good knowledge of what are the differences and what are the similarities between DNA and RNA. You don't have to memorize a ton of stuff. I do want some broad things, but for example, probably the biggest thing and what it's named after, remember DNA is deoxyribose nucleotide, is that DNA, this is where the DNA links this OH down to the next DNA, and over here is just a regular H that's not very reactive. In an RNA, there's an OH right here, and remember OHs are very reactive, they bind with things, they do all kinds of stuff. So that's one of your first differences. Second difference is that you have a different nucleotide structure in RNA instead of DNA, so this uracil. But as far as similarities go, you still, everything is always going to be binding up and down with the phosphate group. So remember the phosphate group is what goes up and binds to the next DNA. And then this phosphate group is down here. It's still, they each still share a lot of the same bases, for example. And remember, so the carb, the five carbon sugar and the phosphate, these are pretty, these are pretty solidly consistent across any kind of nucleotide. It's only going to change at this little OH group, for example. But this nitrogenous base, this can be any of these things, remember. And this is kind of the beginning of how we start pairing things up is that on each little nucleotide, which is right here, full structure, we have the nitrogenous base that of whatever it is, so A, T, Cs, or Gs. Those As are gonna go with Ts, those Gs are gonna go with Cs. I will not ask you to memorize which ones go with which. The main concept I want you to know here is that DNA runs in this helix. It is double-stranded and it's anti-parallel. See how this is going up this way. This strand is going up this way, down this way. And it says it right here, anti-parallel. 
is basically just means that we can do a bunch of DNA synthesis. I'm not going to ask you um, anything like direct about like this replication process yet. Just know that DNA is it's transcribing into RNA. RNA doesn't come. RNA doesn't produce DNA. DNA produces RNA. So just remember that DNA to RNA to proteins. Remember. So right here's that constant phosphate group. So if I ever mention anything like, okay, what's a common factor between DNA and RNA? It's always that these little phosphate groups are going to provide those big linkages between the nucleic acids. And that's always going to be a constant. But probably your best resource is right here. The key thing that I need you to know is this structure and how it's different. See how this is two strands. It's very stable. RNA is one strand. It's not stable. Things are eating it from the side here. It has those little OH groups, remember? Remember it has the reactive OH. And those reactive OHs are gonna do all kinds of stuff in the environment. Whereas DNA is nice and safe and it has that nice double strand. And so, as you can see, this is supplemental. We're not at DNA replication yet, but we will be, so it'll be good.